In industry, a data set can have hundreds and even thousands of potential model features. And using dimensionality reduction methods like PCA can leave you with features that are hard to explain. Thankfully, feature clustering can help create a short list of features and an interpretable model. Hi, I'm Connor and welcome to ADO. Today, we'll be applying hierarchical clustering for feature selection. We'll be using Python and you can find a link to the code in the description. We'll also explain the theory behind this method and discuss its benefits over other clustering methods for feature selection. We end by gaining some intuition of how the method works using correlation heat maps. Before we start, you may want to check out this previous video where I discuss how to do feature selection with an interpretability mindset. To summarize, I explain how you should divide a large set of features into smaller groups of similar features. Then, to reduce the amount of redundant features used to train a model, you can select the most predictive features from each group. You can do this manually when you have a small number of features. But as your feature set grows, you will need some help. This is where hierarchical clustering comes in. It is a statistical method that allows you to create groups of features where the features within a group are correlated and uncorrelated with features in other groups. Hierarchical clustering is usually used to group similar instances in a data set. It does this by creating a tree-like structure. As we transverse down the tree, the instances are split into groups. This is done in a way so that the instances within a group are similar to each other and dissimilar to instances in other groups. We will be using this algorithm not to group instances, that is the rows of a data set, but to group features, that is the columns of the data set. To explain how this method works, we'll be using the credit score data set. It contains 84 features for 1000 customers based on their transactions and financial position. We use this data set to estimate a customer's credit risk, which is given by credit score. You can find a full link to a more detailed explanation of this data set in the description. We start with all the continuous features in our data set. The credit score data set has 78 continuous features. We treat these all as a cluster of one feature and label them cluster zero to cluster 77. Using some measure of distance, we calculate the distances between all the clusters. We can visualize this as a 78 by 78 matrix. The white squares give the distances between the clusters. The next step is to find the smallest distance among all the clusters. Suppose that this is between cluster 48 and 49. We group these two clusters into one cluster and label it cluster 78. The original clusters 48 and 49 are removed and we then update the distance matrix. It will now contain the distances between cluster 78 and all the other clusters. We repeat this process. At each step, we group the clusters with the smallest distances and recalculate the distances with this new cluster. At some point, we will join clusters of multiple features together. We stop when we have one cluster that contains all the features. This is the root node of the hierarchical tree. In our case, this will take 77 steps. In general, it will take one less step than the number of continuous features you initially start with. The big question is, how do we calculate these distances? There are many methods we can use. They should all provide some measure of similarity between features. The first step is to decide on the distance metric between individual features in a cluster. The default is the Euclidean distance. To calculate the distances between clusters, we must then aggregate all the distances between the features of the clusters. Take these two clusters for example. Using the Euclidean distance, we calculate D1 and D2. These give us the distances between the features in the clusters. We could then use the average method to calculate the distance between the clusters. This is by taking the average of the individual distances. In our application, we will use Ward's method to calculate cluster distance. This method calculates the variation between clusters using the sum of squares of the Euclidean distances. 
The result is clusters where the variance between clusters is maximized and the variance of the features within each cluster is minimized. At the end of this chapter, we will see the benefit of this when it comes to producing homogeneous groups of features. If you're interested in this type of content, then make sure to sign up to my newsletter in the description. You'll get free access to an explainable AI course with shifting public sentiment and movements to regulate AI like the EU AI Act, factors in machine learning like interpretability, safety, fairness, and transparency will become more important in the future. The course gives you the tools to help stay ahead of this trend. Going forward, we will only apply hierarchical clustering to the continuous features. It is always best practice to exclude the categorical ones. This is because we are using Euclidean distance. Trying to apply this to calculate the distances with categorical features can produce skewed results. This is true even if we replace the groups in the features with integer values. In our case, we have six categorical features. We could consider these as another cluster or make a judgment whether to include them in the shortlist on an individual basis. If you have a large number of categorical features, you may want to apply a different clustering algorithm to them. You could also transform them into continuous features using the weights of evidence transformation and then apply the same approach. Okay, so let's jump to the notebook to apply this method. The key functions are the linkage, dendrogram, and F cluster from the SciPy package. These are used to create, visualize, and select clusters respectively. We also have the standard scalar, which is used to standardize our data. Okay, we load our data set and select only the continuous features. Importantly, we scale the features so they all have a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. Remember, we are using Euclidean distances. If we do not scale the features, then features with relatively large values will have larger distances and skew our results. For example, total income will have much larger values than say the debt to income ratio. The next step is to transpose the matrix. As mentioned, hierarchical clustering is usually used to group instances. And so it will group by the rows of a data set. By transposing the matrix, we end up with a row for every feature and a column for every customer. We can see this by outputting the shape, which gives 78 by 1000. We use the linkage function to perform hierarchical clustering. We set the parameters so that we use the Euclidean distance as our distance metric and Ward's method to calculate the distance between clusters. This produces a linked matrix, which has the shape of 77 by four. This contains the 78 minus one clustering steps. Lastly, we use this code to create a data frame of the linked matrix. C1 and C2 give the indices of the two clusters included in the new cluster created during that step. Distance is the distance between the two clusters and size is the number of features in the resulting cluster. Looking at the first step, cluster 48 and 49 correspond to the features total expenditure on housing in the last 12 months and total expenditure on housing in the last six months. It makes sense that these two features are similar. They are grouped to form cluster 78. Clusters 48 and 49 are removed. We calculate the new distance and move on to step two. You can see that eventually we group clusters of multiple features. For example, row eight where cluster 73 is grouped with cluster 84 to form a cluster of three features. The best way to visualize this clustering process is using a dendrogram. To do this, we pass our linked matrix into the dendrogram function. We also order the chart so that the root cluster is at the top and individual features are at the bottom. 
Looking at the dendrogram, you can see the tree-like structure created by the clustering algorithm. When two clusters are merged, we have a new fork in the dendrogram. The height of the fork on the x-axis is determined by the distance between the two clusters that formed the new cluster. In our case, it is the ward's distance. If you zoom in on the plot towards the left-hand side, you can see the fork for the first step. That is the one where total housing 12 and total housing 6 would join to create cluster 78. Notice that the ward's distance is relatively small. As we progress, the distance will increase until we join the final two clusters, which have a distance of over 140. Seeing the dendrogram highlights an important benefit of this clustering method, flexibility over the number of clusters. We could select a maximum distance and consider all the clusters below this distance. Conversely, we could select a maximum number of clusters and use the distance cutoff that gives us that amount of clusters. We take the latter approach using this code. The F cluster function is used to create a label for each of the 78 features, setting t equals to 10 and criterion equals to max clust, the f clust function will find the minimum distance that gives us 10 clusters. The result is a list of 78 labels with values from 1 to 10. These are our feature groups. Selecting features from these groups can give us our feature shortlist. To do this, as discussed in a previous video, we must also use some measure of feature importance. We will use correlation. This code calculates the correlation between each of our features and our target variable, credit score. These are used to create a list of correlation values. We then create the DF cluster matrix, which contains the features their cluster label and correlation with the target variable. Both positive and negative correlations are a sign of a significant relationship. So we add the absolute of the correlation values. Finally, we order the feature within each cluster by the absolute correlation. You can see a snapshot of the final matrix, and we can see the most predictive features in each cluster. At this point, you could copy these results into a program like Excel, where they can be manipulated. The process we just described will produce statistically optimal clusters, but you should rearrange them so that they become more intuitive. Additionally, you may want to divide some of the larger clusters and combine some of the smaller ones. For example, cluster one has 19 features, but cluster nine only has three. Crucially, this is the point where you incorporate domain knowledge and other factors into the feature shortlist. Okay, let's gain some intuition for what the algorithm is doing. We'll take a closer look at the clustering results to understand how they can eliminate redundant features. So to start, let's get the names of the features in cluster two and cluster three. We create a correlation matrix of the features in cluster two. We do this using a Seaborn heat map, and you can see that we are dealing with some highly correlated features. We repeat the exact same process using the features in cluster three. Again, we have some highly correlated features. Now, Let's create one big feature matrix with both of the cluster groups. Clearly, there are two groups of features. The first nine features are from cluster two and the remaining six are from cluster three. We can see correlations between the features of different groups are not as strong. This is exactly the point of feature clustering. We have created groups of features that will provide similar information about the target variable. At the same time, they will provide different information to features in the other groups. If we select one or two features from each cluster, 
we will reduce the amount of redundant features in our shortlist. Another way of looking at this process is that it reduces the dimensionality of the feature space. This is done in a way so that we end up with a set of features that will not be highly correlated. There's another process that does exactly this, principal components analysis. The important difference is that features created using PCA are not interpretable. They consist of information from multiple features and they are a nightmare to explain to a non-technical audience. Using hierarchical clustering, we retain the original features and their relationships with the target variable will be easier to explain. If you made it this far, I'm guessing you'll enjoy my other explainable AI content. Check out this video, which gives an introduction to the field. Or check out this video, which is the one YouTube thinks you'll enjoy the most. Otherwise, remember that you can get my XAI course for free with the link in the description.